Hello again, witches, seekers, and friends, and welcome to the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast, the show where we do a little ranting, raving, and wand waving. I'm your host, Paige, and together we're going to explore magic and spirituality, social justice, the psychic realm, and most importantly, magical protection. Hey friends, and thank you so much for joining me here today on the Fat Feminist Witch. Today's topic is magical protection, using spells and rituals to protect your body, home, emotions, psychic self, and even your friends. This is the second episode in a new series of episodes about baneful bitchcraft, so curses, hexes, and taboo magic for revenge or destruction. Now, protection spells aren't inherently baneful, of course, but many are used in self-defense. It's also pretty prudent to cast protection spells on yourself before casting curses or, you know, as part of a larger ritual where you're trying to heal from the effects of that. It can be done at any time around the home to make you feel more safe, more secure, to make sure your home is protected, and it can be done around your body anytime you leave the house. So we are going to talk a little bit today about ways that you can cast protection magic, why you might, and some of my favorite, um, you know, tips and tricks and spells and um, ingredients that I use to cast protection magic in my life. So as we talk about often, all magic is only as good as the real world actions that you use in concert with it. And and protection magic comes with this little extra warning label for this. So although, you know, this magic can be very powerful, it does not take the place of something like a a well-locked door or even a, a restraining order. So if you are afraid of your personal safety, these spells are something that you can do while you're changing your locks or your phone number, reaching out to support people, hiring extra security, taking Krav Maga classes, you know, like whatever. (laughs) This is important because I don't want anything bad to happen to you. So get a new deadbolt and then enchant that deadbolt to make anyone who wishes to do you harm unable to find your house or apartment, for example. Much like baneful magic, protection magic also has different types and categories. Let's start with shielding, which is protection for a person or or a body. So this is your most immediate form of personal protection. In essence, you are using magic to create a metaphysical barrier between your body or a body and the outside world. And you can use physical or metaphysical means to accomplish this. It's fun, right? The most basic method of shielding is through visualization or imagination, and it can be done on a moment's notice, which is great. This really is the method that I use the most. I begin by imagining my aura, you know, the kind of bubble of energy that surrounds all of us. If I want to be stealthy or just be able to go out without drawing the attention of strangers, I imagine my aura getting thicker. And and not as close to my body, you know, it becomes more of a a barrier than something that's attached. Then I kind of see these mirrored panels come down and close around the aura from the crown of my head all the way under my feet, completely encircling me in in what is basically a magical disco ball. (laughs) And I know that sounds funny. (laughs) You could also imagine it kind of, you know, just like all of a sudden it becomes a shimmery mirrored surface, but I like the disco ball. I have one of those faces that strange older men just have to get really close to uh, and talk to on the street. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, it's just the way it has always been. Though I do notice it it happens more in like Little Italy and other Italian communities because they can tell that I'm Italian, I guess. <laughs> and those times, it actually kind of makes me laugh because usually those guys are pretty you know, they just want to say hi, really. <laughs> They're just friendly old guys. But anyways, um, what I like about this this method of visualization is that I can take a minute anywhere to shut my eyes and imagine my little mirrored like storm windows closing all around me. And the power of that is coming from from me, from my mind, my aura, and my magic. And that's a very empowering feeling. Speaking of, you know, cute old old Italian guys, uh, the evil eye is one of my favorite, like, historical bits of magic. 
In the Mediterranean, like Italy and Turkey, the evil eye is a spell cast by someone through a look and like a strong feeling. So jealousy is the most obvious emotion associated with the evil eye, but I could tell you this as a fat person, you can just feel hateful looks whether they're jealous or not. <laughs> not all looks are hateful, and not all are strong enough you know, to really feel, but a lot are. I'm sure other people that have an appearance that, you know, warrants a warrants a, a strong emotional reaction from other people can, can kind of back that up. So the mirrors not only hide me, but they reflect that look and that energy that they're sending sending out back at the center. So I think a lot of people discount the evil eye as a, you know, just like a bit of accidental magic that can't really affect someone. <laughs> but I have to d disagree. As, as I mentioned, you know, I'm someone with physical features, as I like to say it nicely, that draw strong emotions from people. Um, what I really mean there is that, you know, fat phobia is, is really prevalent. So <laughs> fat phobia is very prevalent. So you can often feel looks depending on what you wear, where you're going, what, what you're doing, or really what I'm doing. I can feel people watching me or staring at me or judging me. And sometimes that's just me, but sometimes that really does come from around me. And my mirror disco ball there just helps me bounce that back so it's not affecting me so much. In a future episode, we're going to talk more in depth about breaking curses that are cast on you, including the evil eye. But, you know, I just wanted to mention it since it is one that can regularly be thrown around, bounced around out in the world. You know, it can happen on the street, in a party, you know, it can happen from physical contact or just from a look. It just is a type of magic that can come anywhere. Another way that I've used this, this kind of mirror spell is to also have those mirrors on the inside of my bubble, you know, reflecting back at me. Because, as I said, sometimes just because none of those eyes are on me doesn't mean that I haven't completely convinced myself that they are. This just happens sometimes. You know, we all have moments of, I guess paranoia is the right word, of, of paranoia, of feeling like everybody's judging us. Um, with mental illnesses, certain mental illnesses, obviously this can be a little bit more social anxiety is one of those but it can happen at any time those mirrors remind me to focus on myself and to stop looking around at other people for trouble or for you know at those times often i'm looking for validation i want someone to look at me like oh yeah you look great today or whatever those mirrors kind of help me remember that i don't need to look outside for those kind of feelings. Shielding can also be done using physical, magical items like crystals, talismans, and good luck charms, mojo bags, and magical plants. Uh, and those are usually in the form of sprays or oils, which I also use a lot. So when you're looking for protective crystals, the easiest place to start is with black ones like black tourmaline, obsidian, jet, onyx, smoky quartz, and hematite. Um, any sort of, in magic, black represents protection, a barrier. So using black crystals, you, you instantly know that they have that protective quality. But of course, with all of these crystals, it is slightly different. So black tourmaline is your all around protective stone. Though this is something I'm more likely to use around the house than carry with me, because tourmaline, uh, the, the type of crystal it is, it can, it can break apart, right? It's the kind of those long sheets of rock rather than a, a solid crystal. So that's not something I carry with me because it, it can get ruined. So I keep a large piece on my desk for magical cyber security. Uh, it helps you from feeling drained by electronics, helps you stay private online, all that kind of stuff. Um, it also, I think, 
I feel like I'm less likely to get into a fight with like a Twitter troll or, <laughs> you know, whatever, someone online who wants to start a fight with me when I've got some black tourmaline on my desk or in my hand. Obsidian is, is my favorite black stone. There are a few varieties, but when it comes to protection, I really like to get, you know, those jagged kind of raw pieces or those that have been carved into arrows. The volcanic energy of obsidian is like, it's something that you can really, really feel like you're holding this thing and you think, wow, this was formed inside a volcano. Um, and you also have these, these rough, kind of sharp, glassy edges. You can also get obsidian mirrors, and these are great for reflecting people's negativity back at them. Jet is a protection stone for when you are under attack, someone's attacking you. So it diffuses violent tendencies and expressions of anger, both in you and from others. So it can theoretically help protect you from violence. It's a powerful stone for casting curses, um, especially for self-defense. So any sort of spells like banishing or getting people to leave you alone in a serious way. Onyx helps protect the mind and allows you to see through abusive behaviors like gaslighting. Gaslighting is so insidious. We, we hear this word all the time. Um, and I, I don't think everyone quite understands how intense gaslighting is. When you are being gaslit, it means that someone is lying to you, but they're not just lying. They're lying about your own experiences or, you know, what you've seen to make you doubt yourself, doubt yourself. Um, they're trying to make you believe that they know what happened. You have no idea what happened. What you saw, what you heard, what you experienced is not real. You must be confused. You're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. So an abusive partner who is caught cheating will gaslight the other partner into believing that they are not cheating and also that the, you know, the partner, the accuser is confused or crazy, seeing things wrong. That is such an insidious problem because after a while that can get to anyone. Anyone can be subjected to gaslighting. It really depends on how good of a liar that other person is. And some people are incredibly good liars. What an incredible skill. Like I'm, the, <laughs> I have been the worst liar in the whole world since I was a little kid. And uh, it bums me out sometimes because there's times when you just, <laughs> you just need to. But gaslighting is never okay. Smoky quartz is what I jokingly refer to as metaphysical brass knuckles. <laughs> um, this stone empowers you to protect yourself. So it helps you set your boundaries and then actually hold people to them. It helps you speak up about things that are wrong. It helps you trust your instincts about that stuff. Uh, it also helps you stay calm in scary situations. So this is the crystal that you bring to a fight, for example. Or anytime, anytime you are gearing up to have to fight for yourself, Smoky Quartz is a great ally then. Hematite, or hematite, depending on the person you talk to, is a very interesting protection stone. This is one that can protect you both from outside influences and your own fears and phobias. So things like health scares, the sight of blood or gore, or fears about becoming ill can all be eased when it comes to hematite. It's a really good stone for germaphobes, anyone who is afraid of getting sick, which is a lot of us now because of the pandemic. The, the hematite can help you stay more, it's just more realistic, right? It allows you to see if there's something wrong and, and not see not see all of the imaginary stuff that can convince us. I have found in my, in my research, lots of references to hypochondriacs and people who are generally afraid to be social because of, you know, very personal or even societal health issues, using hematite to block that fear. It's also very grounding and it helps you stay steady. I love hematite, but I can never hold on to it for very long. <laughs> um, I like the rings a lot. I find the rings to be super, super cool, super helpful, but I always break them. Always. 
I wish they would last longer than two weeks, but I talk with my hands a lot. <laughs> so I end up smacking my hands off of tables and, you know, walls and knees and anything else solid around me and my hematites just crack. Some people say that if your hematite ring or jewelry cracks or falls apart, it's because it's absorbed or bounced off all of the negativity it can. So maybe that's what my rings are doing. I kind of hope not because that would be a little bit of a scary level. <laughs> Something that's interesting about all of these black crystals is that they work to absorb negativity and fear increase your survival instinct, and even the will to live. In my crystal encyclopedia, which is the um, Cassandra Easton, Eason's The uh, Complete Crystal Handbook, um, they're all advised for those struggling with their mental health, ongoing anxiety and depression, and even suicidal ideation. A few of them mention it specifically. I want to say again, none of this, none of these crystals are an appropriate replacement for real medical care or support, but it, it is interesting to me that carrying these protection stones on a regular basis kind of helps diffuse both external and internal sources of fear the longer that you use them. So if you can hold on to a hematite ring longer than two weeks, this could be something that you Wear on a regular basis as you are working through some of your issues, trying to become a braver person, trying to, you know, accomplish some things that are difficult or scary for you. I just thought it was really neat that their protection power both faced outward and, and inward. Crystals are great because they already have these inherent properties and uses, you know, all of them have their own individual uses and all you need to do is, is activate your crystal to do its thing. Hold your stone in the hand, concentrate, and it's good. But you can also create something specific that's just for you, that's for protection for something specific, or that is not based on a crystal. Maybe you're not a crystal person. So you can get all of these same properties by creating a mojo bag full of different ingredients for protection, or you can enchant an object to be a, a protective talisman or, or amulet or something. So I'm sure all of you have a good luck term, maybe a piece of jewelry that makes you feel tough or even watched over. Maybe you have a power outfit. <laughs> I. I actually do. I'm not making fun of anyone. I have a power outfit um, or a particular perfume for times when you need to be a badass. I'm sure you have something like that. I personally believe that the creation of protective talismans is something that all of us can do and do do on a regular basis unconsciously. We humans just really, we really pour our emotions and our experiences into stuff. You know, stuff becomes such a such an important placeholder for something that means something to us. This is why as witches we, we cleanse our objects, right? Because sometimes they can hold on to too much stuff or they're holding on to the wrong stuff. Sometimes those feelings that we really pour into an object are not the type of energy that you want hanging around. But you know, if you have a ring from your grandmother or something that always makes you feel like you have a guardian spirit watching over you, well, that's probably because you do, because you've poured that energy into that ring and made that happen. In the movie Practical Magic, which I've already watched three times in the past two weeks as fall approaches, uh, <laughs> Sally Owens, who is played by um, my my dad's celebrity crush, Sandra Bullock, loves her to death, uh, explains to Aiden Quinn, who is completely adorable, that his sheriff's badge, which is a star, does not actually have magical power. She says, it can't stop criminals in their tracks, can it? It has power because you believe it does. We witches often use that same five-pointed star as a protection talisman. And the power is the same the belief of yourself and, and all the witches around you that this pentagram will keep you safe imbues that pentagram with power. I love that. 
that kind of unconscious human magic is just really beautiful to me. Of course, you can also create a talisman on purpose for protection. So to do that, select an object or, or a symbol that you associate with protection. You can create a sigil if you want on a piece of paper, or you can use a piece of jewelry, an item from around the house, whatever. A basic pentacle charm is a really cool example. You know, one that you buy at the store. It's just a hunk of metal on a cord or a chain. <laughs> it's not anything super special, but you can imbue that with protection. So you hold that object in your hands and you kind of pour your protective intention to it. You can visualize creating a magical shield that, that comes out from this talisman or inviting divine assistance to your aid whenever you wear it. You can also just empower it to empower you to defend yourself. You can do this over the course of a few days and really kind of pour that into it or just, you know, in a shorter amount of time. You can create a larger ritual on your altar with other powerful tools and symbols like the crystals mentioned or, you know, other candles, maybe black ones, nice protective energy. Um, a crystal grid, you know, you can circle them in candles. You can create a larger ritual to get some bigger energy going into that talisman. But what really matters is that you're pouring it into the item so that it will hold on to that concentrated energy for you to use when you need it. Afterwards, that hunk of metal <laughs> becomes a magical object filled with defensive energy that you can wear or carry with you wherever you go. You can also create a mojo bag to function this way. So a mojo bag, a charm bag, a magic bag, you combine various symbols or crystals or herbs or curios into a small bag that can be carried with you or kept in the car. A lot of people keep protection amulets in their car. Even non-witches do that, which I think is really neat. <laughs> For general protection, some of the best ingredients are in your kitchen already. So things like rosemary, uh, garlic. Now, if you don't want the smell, you can use like garlic skins, chili peppers, cloves, and salt. These are all super powerful, magical protection items. You can stick a little bit of each in a black or, or a red bag, breathe your intention into it three times before sealing it up. It's called feeding the mojo bag. Um, and there you have a protective talisman. You can also include personal concerns like a lock of hair. This is especially great if you're making the bag for someone else. So it, it ties it to them specifically. Another thing you can add in is sharp objects, things like nails and pins. Um, if you like to go natural, cactus spikes and rose thorns, these are all very protective. These can be a little hard to carry with you, <laughs> um, but they're one that I use a lot, especially at home protection, because carrying cactus spikes is just not something that I'm going to be able to do without stabbing myself. That's just the way things are. <laughs> uh, dragon's blood and frankincense resin, cinnamon and ginger all have these really fiery protection vibes that... I feel are good at helping you defend yourself. You know, it gives you kind of that, that spicy vibe. These are the things you use when you need, you know, you need to go into bitch mode later. You really need to, <laughs> you really need to take control. All of that very fiery energy is good for that. To protect the heart specifically, you can combine some of these things with rose petals or maybe a piece of pink tourmaline instead of a black one and wear the bag inside your bra or on a necklace near your heart. This bit is a little controversial just because I think no one wants to talk about it, but whatever. Heather flowers in magic are used to protect against rape and sexual assault and can help you heal from the aftermath or hex the person responsible. Now, this is, of course, not a foolproof, 100% effective thing. Please do not completely rely on heather flowers to protect you. <laughs> but 
that is their vibe. So when I carry it, I feel like, you know, that thing, that thing that predators can, can read or detect in people, I, I just feel like it's no longer visible. Now, not everyone who's a, a survivor of sexual assault has this particular quality. Um, and realistic, this is not something that science can actually explain, but that's how I feel. I often feel, um, because I've, I've been a victim of a few different kinds of abuse in my life, I have that little thing that scary people can see. They can feel it, they can detect it, they can hone in on it, right? And I just feel like Heather kind of cuts that off so it's it's no longer detectable to others. I like to carry it with me to parties or bars, something like that. Uh, and I also like to put it in bath, in my bath. They're tiny little flowers. <laughs> they can get a little annoying in the bath, so you can put them in a bag if you like, but I don't mind. Um, but yeah, taking a bath in Heather flowers is it's just very nice. It's a very nice feeling that, um, I don't know, it just it feels like it surrounds you. Some of the best cleansing herbs that we work with also have a protective element. So herbs like sage, mugwort, uh, bay leaves, pine and cedar, and tobacco can all be added to mojo bags for protection. Um, they can also, of course, be burned and the smoke wafted around you to cast an air of protection, or they can be used in an oil or spray for the same purpose. Let's shift a little to a very particular type of personal protection, which is psychic protection. Protecting your psyche from bad energies or beings or people, and also protection from the psychic power of others. This is funny because often when we're we're looking at protection magic, we see reference to if someone else is casting energy at us or you know, someone else is maybe casting a curse, someone else is casting their negativity. But I often feel like the protection magic I'm doing isn't actually protecting me from other people and their psychic energy or their magical anything. I feel like it's just protecting me from just the world in general. But, <laughs> but there are, of course, lots and lots of witches psychics and magical practitioners out there and a lot of people keep that to themselves but still project that kind of energy so that's the thing if you're not psychic yourself and don't spend any time around psychics you may feel like psychic protection is not important and that is also okay but it doesn't just you know protect you from negative magical power being purposely cast at you it also can help diffuse and absorb just general energetic junk that we encounter every day. So things just like, you know, negative feelings from someone having a bad day. Have you ever been around someone and their bad day is almost infectious? Um, maybe you have a shitty coworker who's rude and is constantly, constantly, constantly just barraging you with these it's just rude comments, rude actions, and it really gets to you. It can affect you way after you're done work. Uh, maybe you have squabbles and disagreements with your family or your roommates. That can leave energy, you know, not only lingering in you because you're angry, but also around your area, all around you, around the home, that kind of thing. There's also things that give you the creeps, that make your hair on the back of your neck stand up. Um, those are things that often we can't see or explain. That is something from which you need psychic protection. You may also encounter people who feel draining. Um, psychic vampires is kind of the, the word that's most attributed to these people. But I, I feel like vampire implies there's they're doing it on purpose. But some people, it's it's not on purpose. It's just it's just part of who they are. Or something between the two of you that just doesn't just doesn't mix very well. So they might drain the energy or the patience right out of you. You know, being around them makes you tired. It makes you edgy. Um, 
some people just we just don't vibe it happens um some people are also just awful i mean they're just garbage <laughs> and they like to know that they are like kind of draining the the life and happiness out of other people those people are unfortunately everywhere if you are psychic or maybe you're just a, a very sensitive person psychic protection can help help you prevent picking that stuff up in the first place so you don't have to clear it out when you get home hopefully it just doesn't get stuck to you really empathetic people um you know those who can those who can just really feel everything going on around them can especially benefit from this because when you're like that there's always this exchange of energy happening between you and and others you know empathetic people they just kind of suck things up from the world around them not even just people sometimes pictures horrible events etc have you ever read about a like a horrible historical event something really bad you know like the holocaust or for me that bomb being dropped on hiroshima and it leaves you just completely inconsolable for like days. I'm not even alive when these things happened. They're just so horrible that I, I just internalize that like, just all those feelings I feel. To this day, if I see pictures of Hiroshima, the aftermath of, of Hiroshima, which I saw for the first time as a kid, you know, when we learned about it, I instantly feel like my chest is caving in. Like it's just so heavy and I can't breathe and my eyes just start watering and it's just so embarrassing because it happens in public all the time. You know, in school, I cried in the middle of class, just ridiculous. Um, <laughs> it's, it just happens, right? Depending on how much I interact with that information and those photos and stuff, it, it can stick with me for days. And this is just really, really heavy sadness, especially because there's nothing I can do to fix that. Same thing happened to me happens to me after watching um, some movies about the Holocaust. Just, I'm just so sad. And there's just nothing I can do about it. I can't go back in time and fix it. I can't fix how it affected people. There's nothing I can do. It just lingers. Now, this is probably an example of needing psychic protection from yourself, but... <laughs> But if I know it's coming, you know, I, if I know that I'm going to a lecture or something, then that's going to come up. There are things I can do to study myself to prevent those feelings from lingering longer than they have to. I've discovered there's no way to keep myself from crying in public when, when Hiroshima is brought up. <laughs> so embarrassing, honestly. But I can do things to, to bounce back a little better afterwards. God, I'm just like, just mentioning it is making me feel like I just get that feeling in my chest. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm definitely holding on to some crystals right now. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear it in my hand here, but I've definitely got a crystal here for me. Crystals are my favorite tool for psychic protection. And I think it's because I can feel them in my hand or my pocket. I can see them. I can really focus on them. You know, they. I use a couple of my senses to really focus on crystals. Take up a lot of space in my mind, in my mind's eye. Um, and that leaves little room for anything that I don't want to stay in there. Of the black crystals that I mentioned earlier, obsidian, jet, and black tourmaline, are also some of the best psychic protection crystals out there. But you don't have to just go for black crystals. I tend to go for more of purples and blues, ones that are associated with the crown and the third eye chakras, as these are our psychic centers, right? And I want to protect my psychic centers without blocking them up because I use them. Amethyst is an incredible psychic protection crystal. It's healing and empowering for your psychic senses. And it also radiates this very calming energy that can diffuse some of the, the psychic energy that comes from others. It can help you and everybody else around you kind of chill out. Fluorite and Labradorite really help bounce psychic energy away from you. They just 
push it away. And they also stabilize your aura. So these stones can strengthen any of those shields that you may put up via visualization, like your magical disco ball. Uh, Labradorite, Labradorite, sorry, that one's a hard one to pronounce sometimes, also keeps your own psychic energy from being drained from you. So that's a good one to hold on to when you got those vampires hanging around. Blue tiger's eye, which is also known as hawk's eye, can help you can help protect you from believing deception and lies. So this is another one that's really, really great if you feel someone is trying to gaslight you. This is one that can help you see through that. It also helps shield you from fear that's being projected by others and can help you be courageous. Any of the tiger's eye are really, really good for when you need courage and strength because you're going to dive, you know, headfirst into something. Blue tiger's eye is, is really great for the mind and the third eye and seeing through any of the stuff that you might be diving into. Aqua aura, which is, so the aura crystals are quartz that have been heat treated and bonded with a particular type of metal. Aqua aura, I believe, is platinum? Gosh, I should have looked that up before I started recording. So, <laughs> What a silly thing. Uh, aqua Aura is a quartz that has been bonded with, let's say, platinum, and it is this beautiful, shiny aqua color. And, and this one has a kind of specific protection power that I find really, really interesting. And that is, it helps to shield you from an overall feeling that society is hard to live in. So that's one that you can reach to when the world's problems are getting to you. You know, if the news, the news cycle is way too much, but you want to stay informed, you can hold your aqua aura and empower it to allow you to take in the information you need without being weighed down and to help you release the stuff you don't need to hold on to. So the heavy weight of capitalism, of sexism, of all those other, you know, isms, that's the psychic stuff that aqua aura can help you with. For those who are watching the <laughs> American election coverage right now, that might be a good crystal to get a hold of. The one thing about the aura crystals is that, um, first of all, they're usually very small, unless you find big clusters and stuff, but they're usually very small. And because of the process of creating them, they can be a little bit pricey. I know, the heavy weight of capitalism, pricey crystals. Just saying, if you can get a hold of them, they're really interesting type of crystal to work with. Angelite and Celestite, which are the ones I've got here with me, um, both call in protective entities like angels, spirits, or ancestors. What have you? All of these. These divine entities or energies that can intercede on your behalf. You know, for those who, who work with deities, these are also crystals that can help you communicate with those deities. They can also help you contain your own kind of psychic junk, your pollution. Sometimes we can tell when we are being very extra or very high strung or we're, when we're freaking out and it's bothering the people around us. Um, and sometimes we can't. <laughs> but um, these crystals can help diffuse that energy. It's not just about being calm. It's more about not letting it get to others. Uh, likewise, celestite can help you from feeling drained by those psychic vampires. Again, celestite is oddly like one of my favorite crystals. They have this, just this very interesting like powder blue that doesn't seem, I don't know. It just, for some reason, they don't look like something that could go grow in the ground for me. It's just such a, such a sky color. Like... <laughs> Uh, there's something about celestite when I see clusters or geodes or something in the crystal shop that I go to, my hand instantly just sits on top of that celestite. So some are little caves that my hand can stick right in and I'll just stand there for a while <laughs> and I never really know why. Always feel better after. Highly recommend getting a hold of some celestite or angelite, which is not the same 
mineral that has very similar properties and a similar color. Galaxyite, which is a form of Labradorite, basically, is the best stone for repairing the aura and for strengthening it over time. It really helps you feel empowered to enforce your boundaries and pull yourself away from psychic energy that could cause you harm. I also find it incredibly soothing in times when things are really getting to me. You know, it's so strange, but I often find myself waking up with a piece of galaxyite in my hand, and sometimes I remember holding it and then, you know, falling asleep when I'm meditating or something. <laughs> happens all the time. If that happens to you, don't feel bad. It happens to me constantly. Um, <laughs> I love naps. But sometimes I don't remember reaching for this crystal. It's one I keep on my nightstand. And there have been times that I grab it in the middle of the night and I wake up and I'm still holding it. I feel like it helps me work through the things that have been getting to me in my mind, you know, I guess some of those times I'm thinking it through in my dreams, but I just feel like it, it helps my mind work through that stuff a little bit better. Many of these, these stones, these purples and blues, also help to cleanse, clear, and strengthen all of your psychic chakras, which makes them balanced and less susceptible to outside influence. If your chakras are in good working order and they're balanced, you will always listen to yourself and what is important to you over that of others. So your chakras can flit in and out of being balanced all the time. It's not a constant state of being, but you can care for these chakras by meditating, by practicing divination, by working with some of these crystals, and that will help keep them balanced and clear so some of this psychic stuff doesn't get in in the first place. Now, divination is a great example of a, a time and a situation in which to use psychic protection. If you are doing psychic or tarot readings for others, um, if you are, you know, looking into things that are, are less tied specifically to you, so something like exploring the Akashic records, it would be really, really great to create a spell or, or use some of these tools beforehand to protect you from some of that psychic junk without closing up your psychic senses. That's when I like to reach for my, my celestites, you know, <laughs> the celestite, the galaxyite, and the amethyst are the ones that I use the most in those situations. Wild Fawn was founded on the belief that everyone could benefit from more ritual in their lives. These 100% soy wax candles are handcrafted by a Portland witch with their own unique blend of scents to evoke the magic of the seasons and sabbaths. Whether you're burning scents like ritual, with cleansing sage and lavender while you're practicing magic, or relaxing with a witchy book and the harvest candle that smells like autumn leaves and spices, Wild Fawn's aromas are sure to set the perfect magical mood. For you fellow Halloween witches, the Samhain candle smells like summer honey, fall leaves, and tonka bean, all tied together with a crackling wooden wick that really brings that cool and spooky All Hallows' Eve vibe. Find Wild Fawn's entire catalog of scents on their website, the link to which you can find in the description. And do it soon, because from now until the end of October, Fat Feminist Witch listeners can get 10% off their entire order using the code Fat Feminist Witch at checkout on wildfawn.com. I know from experience that anxiety, fear, and depression can keep you from manifesting your most magical life on the best of days. And witches, these days are not the best. That's why if you're struggling or feeling lost, I want you to consider reaching out to a professional licensed therapist through BetterHelp. Within 24 hours, they'll assess your needs and match you with a therapist that is specially trained to deal with everything from depression and anxiety to grief, conflicts at home, and even sexuality and gender across the spectrum. It's all online, so there's no awkward social distancing in the waiting room. You're in the comfort and safety of home. You can message your therapist anytime and schedule weekly audio or video chat sessions. The service is available worldwide. It's more affordable than in-person therapy, and they offer financial aid to those who need it. 
read me, so many people have been reaching out that BetterHelp is actually recruiting more counselors in all 50 states right now. I want you to manifest the life of your dreams, starting today. As a listener, you, you can get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash fatfeministwitch. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash fatfeministwitch. My favorite place to use protection magic is most definitely around the house. Magic can be used to clear out spirits and entities and vibes from your home and then set up magical boundaries and barriers to keep away prying eyes and cheating landlords or, you know, just contribute to a feeling of safety and security in your personal fortress of solitude. Uh, I'm sure it's no surprise to y'all that I am a real home and house person. (laughs) And so protection and cleansing around the home is probably the magic that I actually do most frequently. As I usually just combine it with my regular cleaning or chores, uh, my grocery shopping and even cooking. So for this episode, I kind of, you know, took a moment to take stock of the tools and the spells that I use the most to protect my own home. And I realized I can kind of just track it to four sources. Uh, One is hoodoo. I have a lot of like hoodoo home protection. As far as hoodoo magic goes, the home stuff is, is probably where it comes up the most in my own practice. Then we have Italian folk magic and the book of the same name by Mary Grace Faroon. I I really absorbed a lot of Italian folk magic when I when I read this book and um, having protective items from there feels makes me feel very connected to my roots. Uh, then we have Magical Housekeeping by Tess Whitehurst, one of my favorite witchy books of, of all time, um, and the book that is responsible for getting me back into magic. I began with, you know, magical housekeeping and started doing things around my home to make me feel comfortable, to make me feel productive because I was going to college, to make me feel like it was mine, and to clear out some negative memories and experiences and feelings that had been lingering around. And it did wonders for me. I love magical housekeeping. And finally, some of it is just my intuition. I'm very intuitive about my home. You know, I I can tell when something isn't right. I can track it down like a bad smell. Uh, I can tell if an area's energy is stale or if it's not moving right. I notice things like the behavior of pesty bugs. All of a sudden, there's more bugs in here. What's going on? Is there a mundane reason? No. What's up? And even the reactions of my pets. I'm sure you've had a moment where your dog or your cat is just staring at a blank space on the wall and you're like, what the fuck is there? Happens a lot. (laughs) I like to make my own floor washes um, and will sometimes make something to wash, you know, it's a previously cleaned floor, but I'm looking to spread those energetic properties of the ingredients I'm using around a certain room. And I'll just kind of, you know, mop it all around. So in other words, this is my goddamn jam. And I love it. (laughs) Some of this might, um, might be a little bit of a broken record. If you recently listened to my bedroom episode, I tried to not go too much into the bedroom today because I already did a whole episode on it. But I love myself some home cleansing and protection magic. Um, And before you cast any magic for protection, you really should cleanse out everything. I like to clean, like physically clean and also cleanse at the same time. So things that I do, I will burn incense or herbs uh, like sage, mugwort or rosemary. These are all very cleansing and very protective. And for me, they have a very personal home vibe. You might like something different. So you might like roses or pine or cedar or lavender. These are also super, super popular and they have very protective properties as well as very loving properties. So if you're trying to protect, you know, a home full of kids or, you know, your first home as a married couple, using roses as your cleansing smoke is a great, great way to do that. 
So you carry your, your burning incense or your herbs from room to room. Let the smoke fill it up, you know, get into every corner and windowsill and under the furniture and cracks in the walls. Then open up the windows nice and wide and let that smoke just carry away anything that doesn't belong or that isn't doing any good to you or the other people in the home. This whole little practice, the smoke cleansing, is super popular for moving into a new house. Even people who don't practice magic often will go out and they'll get a little bundle so that they can burn it and clear out the house before they move in. But it can be done at any time. It shouldn't be done every day or anything like that, but when you're doing your you know, regular big clean, maybe you do a big clean every month, kind of like I do because I'm a little lazy the other weeks, but... <laughs> You can also include, you know, spiritual cleansing. Uh, some really great times to cleanse the energy of your home are after a period of illness. So if you've been sick for a while or there's been someone sick in the home, if there have been really bad arguments around the house, if you've had any home damage that you, you had to repair and that caused a problem. And, you know, if you have visits from people who just have that junk following close behind, you can just clear it out. I also like to do things like mark the seasons and especially the new year with a little smoke bath around the house. You know, we're, we're going into a new year. Let's leave behind all of the stuff we've accumulated. The reason that you cleanse the space first, I mean, it just makes sense, but a, a big part of home protection is setting up barriers. You don't want to set up a barrier and trap something inside, right? It just makes sense. I also believe that your overall happiness with your home really makes a difference. When you are happy and you are comfortable with your home, you really establish the spiritual connection with it, especially if you practice magic there. So physically cleaning out anything that makes you unhappy, the stuff is just as important as spiritually cleansing out the stuff. This just ensures that your protection spells will be more effective. You will want to protect everything that is in your home because it is yours and you love it. I think I said this in the episode I did about making magic in the bedroom, but I also want you to make sure that you physically fit inside your home. <laughs> make sure you can move through hallways and walkways and rooms without knocking your knees and elbows off of everything. If you stub your toe every single time you enter a certain room, you will start hating that room and you will just want it to disappear. Believe me. I have this like little theory or belief that a lot of larger people, it's almost like we, we do it to ourselves on purpose. I like old houses and old furniture, which can be kind of bulky. But I've noticed that in the past, when I was less comfortable with myself, I was more willing to bump into stuff all the time in my house and I was constantly irritated like what the hell why am I always you know I've got these bruises on my little hips here and my elbows knock off of every door and it was just you know is kind of a manifestation of my my feelings about my body and when I started to feel differently about my body I noticed that I'm pushing stuff away I'm leaving spaces I I don't want to be knocking into things all the time it's just it really changes the vibe. So, like I said, the main intention of home protection spells is to create this magical barrier around the edges of your home or your property and also to help root you to the home itself. You'll notice lots of spells and rituals for home protection feature the number four. So, you know, you have your four corners, four directions, you've got a square, you've got this foundation. That's what four means in magic. Even in the tarot, the Four of Wands is the card of home. And in my housewife's tarot, it's these wands holding up this very happy housewife in her dream, dream home, you know, expertly cleaned and detailed by this domestic goddess, and she's got herself a little martini. This is the, the card of home. Often I'll, I'll use this card in the spells that I cast. Another thing you'll notice is that a lot of attention is paid to thresholds, doors, and windows. These can all be magically cleansed and anointed, or can be a place where you put a protection symbol or talisman. Some of the spells, they're about getting down on the floor. You know, the floor is such an important part of your home, it, it reaches wall to wall. So you can get down on there, you can scatter things around the house, you can use a magical wash, you can write protective symbols on the floor. There's a lot you can do. Some protection spells are done outside. 
and others are done indoors. Some only work with a house, but most of the spells that I'm sharing have been adapted to apartment living because I live in an apartment building. And then for me personally, I tend to use lots of kitchen and like food type magical tools. So like salt and I have a jar of chilies and a garlic braid in my kitchen for protection. I'll even, you know, cook a, a meal or a food with certain herbs or spices that have protective and positive energy. And then that smell will really fill the house. I'm telling you that the smell of baking cookies or something is super positive and cleansing. And if you add cinnamon, they have a very protective energy. Isn't that great? I'm telling you, it's the best way. <laughs> so let's start outside and, and kind of work our way in. One of my absolute favorite bits of magic in general, but especially with the home, is a hoodoo staple. And that is using railroad spikes at the four corners of your property to make this protective barrier and to keep you rooted in the home so that it, it can't be taken from you. Railroad spikes, I mean, these are what hold down the big wooden railroad ties. So they're big, heavy iron spikes that can be found discarded along train tracks. But I want to be really clear, you have to be careful when you're collecting them yourself. Because it is so, so dangerous and so illegal to pull the spikes out of the tracks. As well it fucking should be, because you could kill people that way. But I mean, also, hanging around near train tracks can be incredibly dangerous and you don't know what you're picking up. Just be careful when you're collecting these. Um, a lot of private property and stuff, you also don't wanna be trespassing around train yards because they take that very seriously. Again, you're just gonna have to trust me on that. <laughs> so the spikes themselves will eventually rattle out on their own. And you know, sometimes they're bent or they're old or they're super rusty, so they'll just be left there and you can pick them up again, as long as it's not private property. Um, and you can find a lot. I, I have like a box of 50 or so that I found in one day walking along one set of tracks. Very cool. So not only are these very heavy duty and they're used to holding train tracks steady so they can hold a lot of, a lot of wild energy. But iron has long been considered protective against magic, uh, especially some magical creatures like fairies, things that might want to cause some mischief or steal from the home. And there are a few different ways to nail down your home with railroad spikes, depending on where you live and what you have access to. So if you're in a house and you have, you know, a full use of the yard, you can take four spikes and you nail a spike at each corner of your property. What would be cool is if you could get um, your partner or your spouse or your kids and family to all do this together. Um, you know, all of you take a turn hammering each spike in so that all of your energy is really connected into the protection of the home. Um, at those four corners, you can also add things like you can sprinkle graveyard dirt from a protective ancestor or from the grave of someone who was, you know, a police officer or something. You can um, sprinkle protection herbs. You can add crystals. You can add salt. You can create these four little corners of magic that create this barrier around your home or around your property. Um, hopefully this will ensure that you won't be forced out before you're ready and that you won't have any horrible mishaps happen while you're in the home. While you're hammering in those railroad spikes, focus on an intention like all who dwell here will be safe. Uh, thieves will not be tempted to burglarize my home. No one can venture onto my property without my permission. Maybe you don't want your house to be as obvious. You can, you can think of something like that, like, um, my home is really only obvious to those who are invited here. Things like that. Now, if you're in an apartment building, it's a building with many apartments, I don't really recommend doing this because that to me feels like you're taking on the responsibility to keep every unit safe and protected. And that just, I, I don't think I have the energy for that. <laughs> uh, also, you want the barrier of this protective you know, force field to go across your own threshold to protect you from any threats that come from the inside of the apartment building, which is how people get in, right? So take your four railroad spikes and four, you know, mason jars or coffee cans. Coffee cans would be the best that are tall enough to hold the spikes and collect some dirt from each corner of the apartment's property. 
the apartment building's property. Um, fill each container with dirt from a corner, a spike. If you want to add anything else, um, I, I like to sweep some of the, the dust and whatever is lingering at my own threshold, kind of sprinkle that on top as well. Um, and put those in the corresponding corners of your apartment. So you're tied to the location, the physical location of the apartment. You're, you know, hopefully not going to get evicted anytime soon, but you have that barrier going around your actual apartment. And then you can, you know, put those in the four corners and you can keep those until you leave. If you have no grass anywhere on the property, and so there's very little like dirt, there's no soil, just get one spike and one can or container, sweep up whatever dust or dirt that you can from those corners, um, some from your threshold, put it all in one can, <laughs> and then just keep it behind the main door. You wanna have still those, those four um, grounding elements in your spell. Like I said, the number four is very grounding and stabilizing. You can you can do a million things with the railroad spikes. Okay, so hoodoo is it's known for its really cool like oil blends and powders and stuff for very specific purposes, and they have ones like landlord uh, keep away oil. So this is really great to dress your spikes with if you're renting your home, if you have a really nosy landlord, um, whatever. Likewise, if you conduct any illegal activities at home, there is law keep away oil. So. You can dress the spike with the oils um, and then herbs, powders, you know, colored strings, personal concerns. You can put a lock of your hair in there. Um, anything else that you feel will best protect you. You can go as far as you want with the railroad spike. And I like that. It's very creative. You can also create this barrier around the edges of your property with things like a line of salt all the way around. You can use crystals planted at the four corners, something protective like a, a black crystal, like an obsidian. Even a clear quartz would be really great. You can grow protective plants in your garden. You can grow hedges, so holly hedges. Holly is a very protective plant. It's got those sharp leaves grown as a hedge. This is a really nice magical barrier. And of course, you can use your own magic via your imagination or visual visualization. Let's move a little closer to the home <laughs> and talk about doors and windows. Now, I'm sure I don't need to actually explain this, but doors and windows are how shit gets in your house. <laughs> so using magic to cleanse and fortify your doors and windows can help keep out pests, human pests, animal pests, and spiritual pests. <laughs> pests that's fun uh you can keep people who wish to do you harm or exploit you from wanting to enter your home you know you can <laughs> you can keep away whatever if you don't want all the junk mail you can do that you can keep noisy neighbors from looking into your windows and throwing those evil eye or that shade right into your <laughs> right into your bedroom or your kitchen or whatever you can do so much I like to sweep any dirt that's on my threshold regularly, just outward, get it right out of here. Uh, if you want to wash the door, um, and right now it's actually really good to wash your doors and, and handles pretty regularly anyways. Um, but after it's clean, physically clean, you can wash the door with a spiritual cleanser like Chinese wash or spray it down with Florida water. I also use Florida water, which has a lot of alcohol in it on the peephole alcohol evaporates quick so it's not going to just stay wet in there um, but the intention there is that I can always kind of clearly see who's at the door and I can tell if their intentions are you know good or bad I can make a decision about whether or not I want to open it I like to sprinkle a line of salt across the threshold and just kind of seal everything up in hoodoo and voodoo red brick dust is also used this way and you've got this nice kind of solid line I have an old iron horseshoe that hangs above my front door. This is for protection and also for good luck. And it kind of, I feel like it showers that good luck on anyone that goes through it. I also have a mirror right inside my door, but that faces outside. So anyone who tries to look in my door just gets a view of their own, own little jealous or, you know, greedy eyes. Perfect. Actually, you can put mirrors basically anywhere for this purpose. And I love that. That's one of my favorite um, things. I'll just put little ones in the windows if I feel like I'm being watched. Windows 
speaking of, um, are best kept clean and accessible so that light and energy can flow through and around your windows. Just like the door, if I feel they need a spiritual cleansing, um, I like to use Florida water and I can put that line of salt right across the sill. I actually hadn't done this, you know, since I moved in. I, I did all of this before I moved into my apartment and I hadn't done any of the big stuff since, just kind of general upkeep, right? But recently I awoke to the sound of my cat, Allie, the little one that uh, all of you guys really pitched in and helped get fixed and healthy. I heard her outside, which is weird because I live three floors up. <laughs> I have no balcony and my fit my windows they all face this courtyard in the middle of the building it doesn't have access it doesn't have plants or anything it's just it's just to give the inner apartments of this building windows so we get sunshine i figure she chased this squirrel that's been <laughs> it's been very interested in the plants that i have hanging out the window i'm just really lucky she didn't break her legs she didn't get hurt uh long story short <laughs> <laughs> that was like an hour or two of me freaking, but I had to lower one of those reusable grocery bags, the plastic ones that, you know, they have that kind of solid shape. I lowered it down with a rope and I hauled her up into the window. <laughs> Some of my neighbors on other floors had woken up and they're like, oh my God, is that your cat? And they were trying to, you know, cheer on to get her to stay in the bag as I'm pulling her up. I can't believe that stuff happens in real life. I'm a cartoon character. It's just so silly. Um, but, <laughs> but I noticed that she wouldn't go near the window after, you know, she used to love to sit on the windowsill. So I recently cleaned it. That's another cat. I recently cleaned it with Florida water swept away any dust and the peanuts that squirrels had been hiding there. I washed the windows so that they were sparkly and today she's back up sitting on the sill. So I think that some of that fear that she felt when she realized she was going down and it was a long way was probably lingering there and freaking her out. Uh, luckily, I said, like I said, she is totally okay. It was so, it's so weird. <laughs> Only, only Allie would, would find her way outside like that and land on her feet three floors. That's nuts. <laughs> if I ever feel like I don't have privacy, like I'm being watched in the house, I'll wash the windows with Florida water. If you get the classic Landman and Murray stuff, it is so alcoholic, like it evaporates instantly. It's basically Windex. You can spray it right on or you can mix it with, you know, warm water, maybe some vinegar. And that's a great window cleaner. As a bonus, you can clean your mirrors with the Florida water. So you put that protective barrier against any spirits or entities that might find their way into your home through a mirror. Once you get indoors, you can hang objects or talismans for protection, like my garlic braid or a chili pepper braid. That's some Italian folk magic. Likewise, uh, you know, a branch or a sprig of rue or a palm from Palm Sunday, those can be hung over the door or inside the kitchen. You can get uh, the Turkish Nazar charms, the, the big blue eye, and hang them where they can be seen through windows or mirrors or like, you know, by the door. That way that is, you know, reflecting that evil eye outward. You can use crystals, put your protection crystals by your doors, by your windows. You can get protective indoor plants. Uh, spider plants are great. And if you really want something, you know, with balls, you can get yourself some cacti with some wicked spikes. <laughs> you can also create your own sigils and use protective symbols like pentacles, and you can hang those around the place. You can make paintings and carvings of those and hang them wherever you feel like energy could accumulate there or that this is a mo you know, a place where energy can get into your home. Now, if you're in an apartment like I am, you don't have an outer outside there perimeter because you're the apartment. So you can fortify this boundary indoors by getting yourself a, a bowl of salt and in every single room, just throw a little handful in each corner and then go around clockwise and sweep all of that salt into the middle and dispose of it. 
another Italian folk magic trick, and that is simple. You know, if you're already sweeping, why not throw a little salt down and, and get that spiritual cleansing going? I've met a lot of people who keep um, obsidian or black tourmaline in the corners. So in the corners of each room or in the four corners of the house. It depends on how much tourmaline you have, I guess. <laughs> Finally, you can invite helpful spirits or beings or gods or angels or what have you into your home with the intention of protecting you and end. Of course, you got to be a little careful with that. Don't invite anything you don't know. <laughs> um, and if it's any sort of god or deity, look into offerings first. If they're the kind of god that's vengeful, if you don't offer them something, be careful with that. Um, I like ancestors. I have a space for, you know, the spirit of my grandmother to visit. I see her as a guardian. She makes me feel safe and also just like a lot less lonely in the house because I live alone. Ancestors are really great home protectors as long as you have a good relationship with them. So you can set up an altar or a shrine. You can bring in pictures of the ancestor. Or if it's one of these other beings, you can, you know, get statuary. You can get paintings. You can get other representations of them and you can also just talk to them out loud when you're home use the home to communicate with this whatever guardian spirit or being a couple of goddesses I, I actually like around the home I like to have pictures and stuff are Vesta or Hestia who is the deity of the home and hearth um, and Nematona and she is a Celtic goddess one of the only Celtic deities I am very uh, close with, but she is the Celtic goddess of sacred groves. So I have oracle cards that depict both of these goddesses, you know, on altars in the house. They make me feel like, you know, either they're watching over it or that I can tap into that kind of power to make the best use of my space. A lot of people believe that the house or the home itself has a spirit. If you ever watched Marie Kondo's Netflix special, you know, it came out a little while ago now, um, but one of the most beautiful things in that whole season was before she got started cleaning a house, she would kneel down, close her eyes, you know, put her palms down and introduce herself to the house. And one of those times she actually got like really emotional and a little choked up. And all she said was, this is a very nice house, you know, so much love. And I just bawled my eyes out. How beautiful is that? Um, this is an, an animistic pra uh, practice. So maybe sit and try to connect to your home's spirit. Does it have a voice or, or a feeling or a smell? Does it look a certain way? Take some time to regularly commune with your home, with the magic of your home. And you will develop this, you know, protective symbiotic relationship. You give love and care to the home and in return you get safety and warmth. That sounds like a pretty good deal. All of this is kind of general ways that you can protect your home with magic. But you can, of course, get much more specific and protect against certain people, certain situations. Or you may have need for more intense magic. If your house is haunted, or there is something not earthly inhabiting it, I would contact a professional, a medium. You might prefer a paranormal investigator, maybe a psychic, Reiki practitioner, clergy person from your own religion, whatever. You can also, you know, assemble a coven or a group to kind of pool your magic together, give you a little more oomph. That stuff can be scary. I'm very fortunate that I've never had to deal with an extreme situation like that. Maybe it's because I'm way more into these pretend preventative measures, but honestly, I think anyone could get haunted. <laughs> it can happen to the best of us. Now, in a minute, I'm going to be reviewing a book, which is Hoodoo Cleansing and Protection Magic by Miss Aida. And the author goes into detail about some extreme situations, some hauntings, some entities that need to be cleared out. She tells you the kinds of things that you can do yourself and when to call in a professional, when it's out of your hands. It's just like bugs, you know? Most bugs you can keep out of your house. You can deal with that. 
but a full-blown like infestation like if you have a bunch of bees making a hive inside one of your walls <laughs> this calls for the expertise of a professional and magical extermination is no different um, so we're going to get into our, our book review uh, but i mentioned chinese watch a lot of times throughout this little segment here in the book um, you actually get Miss Aida's recipe for Chinese wash. This is a traditional hoodoo spiritual cleanser. It's, it's very lemony, it's very cleansing, and it's also very tied to your home. It often includes straws from your own broom, your own home broom, magical broom, to kind of tie your magic with that of the house. Now, if you don't want to make Chinese wash yourself, I get mine from beaumagique.com. I'll put the link in the description, and I highly recommend it. It's really good stuff. I also like the Florida water I get from them. Though that Lambman and Murray stuff is, has way higher alcohol content. Like this one from Beau Magique is much nicer to like spray on myself or, you know, spray on a regular basis. But when I'm cleaning my windows, that Lambman and Murray stuff, it could strip paint. <laughs> so that's the one I really like when I'm, you know, trying to cleanse and protect my own abode. Before we get into our book review of Shadows, I want to talk about something that's important to be mindful of when you're reading books about non-European magic that is traditionally created and practiced by people of color. In today's case, it is hoodoo, and the people of color in question would be African Americans, uh, Black people, Caribbean people, and often they're from the southern U.S., but not always. In recent years, as we've learned more about the, the harm that cultural appropriation causes, many of us have been trying to buy books and support practitioners who are part of this particular cultural heritage and Black. It's true, it is still easier for white authors to get book deals, you know, teaching these traditional Black magical systems, with hoodoo being the most popular. And I think it's because hoodoo is not a religion in itself but a magical system that can work with any religion. I've been trying to figure out how to approach this issue with my book reviews for a little while now, because I love reading about hoodoo and voodoo. It's only in recent years that we can actually find good books on these topics that are legit, you know? When I was a kid, this stuff was considered, you know, negative, black magic, good witches would never do this. So it's exciting to now have this opportunity to learn. But of course, we have to be mindful and responsible about where we get our information. And unfortunately, this is a lot more complicated than I think some people realize. I have seen a lot of people online pass up on a book or article or something because the author doesn't appear black enough in their bio and their author photo. I've seen individual authors being called out for being white and writing on these topics. And sometimes those white authors, you know, they learn something because that's important. But other times we learn that just because someone looks white, <laughs> it doesn't mean they don't come from these families and these cultures and these ethnicities that these traditions have passed through. To make it simple, when I get right down to it, I do not feel qualified to pass judgment on whether or not someone has the right to write books about or practice hoodoo, especially not based off of an author photo and four lines of bio. You know what I mean? I, I honestly don't think that any of us white people can really be the arbiters of how black or Latino someone is or should be. There's a big difference between calling out cultural appropriation in the field of modern spirituality, which is so necessary, and attacking individuals based on, a lot of times, just assumptions. It's good to confront a publishing company about their tendency to publish, especially hoodoo books, written by white people. But it's bad to confront someone who looks white in the back of their hoodoo book and rally all your fellow witches to boycott them. <laughs> Now, if you've done this, it's okay, you're learning. I've totally, like, joined the herd more than one time and kind of canceled somebody. You know, it happens. We're all learning. But as we all know, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> that, that saying is a thing for a reason. Um, 
I recently reviewed Utterly Wicked by Dorothy Morrison, which is heavy on hoodoo magic, very heavy on it. And a few people commented or even emailed me to tell me that they wish I wouldn't be plugging a white hoodoo writer, um, or that I should have put, you know, a little disclaimer that this was a white woman cultural appropriation. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't figure out, I couldn't figure out a way to do that. What I did instead was include a little tidbit of information about Ms. Morrison's background so that you readers could make your own decision about whether or not to support her work. I don't know if a lot of people noticed it was very small. But Dorothy Morrison is from Texas, a place where hoodoo and even Mexican spirituality are incredibly prevalent. She comes from a part of the U.S. where hoodoo originated, and in a lot of ways, hoodoo is a part of the kind of dominant magical or spiritual culture where she's from. Now, does that make her writing about hoodoo non-appropriative? I have no fucking idea. None. (laughs) But it does give you a little bit of info to help you make your decision or to, to fuel your own further research. I personally feel super uncomfortable pointing out how white someone is, especially when I don't know them personally. That just doesn't feel, that again, just doesn't feel productive. If I'm wrong, that's going to be hurtful. I'm really erasing someone's identity now, and I don't want to do that. I also feel uncomfortable saying this entire, this person's, you know, entire magical career especially for much older writers, is completely null and void because they are white and they maybe retroactively shouldn't have been writing about some of that stuff. And I just I just know that that's not how it works. You know, it's not, pun intended, that black and white. It's a little more nuanced than that, right? It really is something you have to take on a case-by-case basis. So going forward, I think this is how I'm going to deal with this situation. While I am reading books on hoodoo, voodoo, or other African traditional religions, I'm going to watch for mentions in the text or in the bio of the author's background, their tutelage, their family, their ethnicity, all of that, and I will share what I find with you. You can then decide if this is an author you want to support or maybe someone you want to do more research on before getting a book. I hope this will help us all make much more mindful and educated choices about where we get our information in the future without attacking any, you know, individuals. So let's talk about today's book, Hoodoo Cleansing and Protection Magic by Miss Aida. Miss Aida is a very well-known and respected hoodoo practitioner and writer from right across the river from me in Detroit. So cool. In interviews with her, um, the Lucky Mojo Rootwork Hour had an interview with her and her her Michigander accent. Oh, it's just so beautiful. It sounds like home. (laughs) She has been teaching and practicing my whole life. Her past books were put out by Lucky Mojo Curio Co., uh, which makes them a little harder to get because they don't do ebooks, right? And this one, um, Hoodoo Cleansing and Protection Magic, is the first one put out by Wiser Books. So here's what I learned about her background from the personal stories shared throughout the book. She comes from a Cuban family whose members practiced Santeria, Palo, and Brujeria, as well as, you know, the American folk magic that we know as hoodoo. She has been formally initiated into um, both Lukumi or Santeria and Palo and received Catholic communion as well. She refers to her mother as a witch or a bruja many times and shares that she spoke Spanish as her first language because she is Cuban. Um, She mentions her aunt and her mother both using eggs for cleansing, doing egg cleansing, which is very, very big in hoodoo and in a lot of Latin American magic. In general, she shares lots of really cool little stories throughout the book about the practices of her family, especially the women I noticed, that illustrate that this magic has always kind of been a part of her life. So that's her background. Let's take a look at the actual book. I gave this book a very solid four crystal balls out of five. I liked it a lot. I don't think I realized quite how much information would be packed into this, like, you know, kind of normal sized book. Despite liking it a lot and and reading it pretty straight, it took me so long to get through it. And that's because there's just so much in there. The book really has 
everything that you could need to know about protection magic in the hoodoo tradition, from taking care of your aura, um, you know, how to know if you've been cursed, how to protect your home, and a bunch of methods for cleansing like baths and washes and incense. It's really clear that Miss Aida knows her stuff. This is something that you can also feel in her voice or tone throughout the book. This book is like, it's oozing wisdom and experience, right? Sometimes books feel like you're having a conversation with a friend who's like a similar age to you. And, um, you know, a similar age, similar background, you know, they're at the same place as you maybe. But Miss Aida's voice is like confident, no nonsense. And she makes it clear that she has the knowledge and the experience with all of these things to back it up. She's telling you this because she knows it, because she's been there, she's done it, and this is what she found. I love that. It felt like I was taking a master class in hoodoo. She also made me laugh. She made me laugh. <laughs> um, at one part, she was sharing other names for curses, like Hex and Jinx. And she said, um, what'd she say? The younger generation calls this throwing shade. And I just like, I just cracked up because the younger generation do call it that. <laughs> I really liked that this book was, I mean, it is real, um, authentic, traditional hoodoo, but also open to people of all faiths. She was so, so good at having both of those things be true in this book. She practices hoodoo, um, Santeria, which she calls, you know, the religion of the saints, and she is a devout Catholic. So this really is classical hoodoo full of prayers to Christian God and the Psalms from the Bible used as spells. And what's great about this is that she actually includes the full prayers and the psalms in the book for those who are not Christian or Catholic. She shares this traditional method and she talks about her own faith and, you know, why it works for her. But she also talks about other religious paths that she admires several times in the book. I believe she mentioned the Wiccans in the very last chapter, how she admired the idea of you know, not hurting anybody with your magic, but doing what you need to do. I thought that that was really, really cool. Um, she offers the Christian prayers and Psalms, if you don't have them, and right above that prayer Psalm, she'll remind you that if this doesn't align with your values, if this doesn't really resonate with you the way, same way it does with her, find something else that does. I thought that was great. You know, it was simultaneously very true to what hoodoo is, um, while being very open to people who are new to it, or that come to it from a different religion. You know, it's not a, it's not a religion in itself. It's a set of practices that can be used in concert with whatever religious path you're on. My favorite parts of the book, um, always come when she shares personal stories. So some of them center around her family and her mother and her mother's magic, and some are around magical clients that she's had over the years. And these stories just, they really make a lot of the lessons that you learn throughout the book come to life. It feels so real. Everything in this book is usable and useful, you know, in your daily life could be easily worked into a regular practice, like spiritually cleansing your home using common cleaning ingredients like ammonia and pine salt. Hoodoo really is all about working with what you can get a hold of, and it comes through in the book. Um, and she also tells you ways that this magic has influenced her life. So you have this whole view of what hoodoo cleansing and protection magic as part of your lifestyle will look like, how it can help you in various situations. Now, the reason this got four crystal balls instead of five, um, it's a personal thing, and it always is, but it's a personal thing. Miss Aida is a nurse, and she actually, oh my god, she served in the Air Force as a combat medic. How badass is that? Uh, this is awesome. And her knowledge um, connecting physical and spiritual health, it's very, very cool. I liked it many, many times throughout the book. But in one part, I did not. She talks about the types of people and the situations that they cause that you may need to protect yourself from. And she categorizes some people, you know, she talks about narcissistic personality disorder or antisocial personality disorder, etc. She talks about narcissists and sociopaths. 
And I'm just not super comfortable pathologizing like badness or evil in that way. She does differentiate between socio and psychopath in a way that actually made sense to me. You know, here's the difference. Um, Sociopathic behavior is learned. It's not what you're born with. You learn it, you pick it up somewhere or it's caused. Um, Well, psychopathy is something that you are born with. You know, it's the way that your brain is made. Neither of things, neither of these things are going to 100% make you a bad person. Plus, <laughs> personality disorders, no matter how much they, they disrupt the lives of people around them, those disorders are almost always born out of trauma, bad trauma. So I don't love using like mental health as a justification for cursing. And I don't feel like that's what she was doing because she's a medical professional. These terms and, you know, framing things this way totally makes sense. And in other places, like I said, her knowledge as a nurse was really helpful and supportive and helped explain whatever it is she was explaining. But in this instance, it just made me feel uncomfortable. All in all, this is a solid like four out of five. It's such an interesting book. It is so, so full of information. So much. I highly recommend it to anyone who wants to learn protection magic for themselves, uh, or if you just want to know more about traditional hoodoo from a legitimate source. Miss Aida is rad as hell. (laughs) I am currently reading an older book of hers, uh, Cursing and Crossing. I mentioned it before. And I am, oh my God, there's so much in there. I am learning things that I didn't even know I didn't know. So... (laughs) So I will keep, be on the lookout for, you know, future books from Miss Aida because I really, really enjoyed this one. So this is our last episode of the month of September and the first episode of the fall season. Isn't that cool? That's so exciting, right? But next week, oh, next week, next week is October, the season of the witch, the first of the 31 days of Halloween. I'm so pumped, you guys. <laughs> Every year in October, I try to explore some aspects of, you know, the Halloween witch here on the show. So one year I talked about Victorian theosophy and mediumship and seances. Um, I dissected fun stuff like the magical properties of Eye of Newt and what it actually is. Why the Wicked Witch had green skin. Why do witches' brooms fly? I did a whole episode about witch cats. I talked about satanic witches, all that great stuff. I tried to balance, you know, spooky Halloween kind of fun and entertaining stuff with real witchcraft and magic for the season. So this October 2020 is a little special. It's a long month bookended by two full moons. That's right. So Thursday, October 1st, we have the full moon in Aries. And then on Halloween, October 31st, we have a full blue moon in Taurus. How cool is that? So because it's Halloween, it's the season, right? I decided to put out an episode every week for the month of October, which means five in total. The first one will be on Thursday, October 1st, and we have an episode about moon magic with the glam witch Michael Herkus. We're talking about his new book, uh, The Complete Book of Moon Spells, and his devotion to the dark goddess Lilith. Super cool interview. He was so lovely. I'm, I'm really excited to share it. Uh, The rest of our episodes for the month will be on Fridays, the second of the month, Friday the 9th. We are going hella basic and talking about pumpkin spice in the film and books, Practical Magic. Okay, get your cozy sweater, your PSL, your infinity scarf. We're just going to revel in our our cheesy basic witchness. It's going to be really fun. So I hope you guys join me every week in the month of October. And I hope you all have a wonderful weekend this weekend, our last weekend of September. The next time you hear from me, it will be the season of witch. To learn more about me, Paige Vanderbeck, or the Fat Feminist Witch podcast, you can check out my website at thefatfeministwitch.com. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest. To support the show, Of course, you can buy my books. Green Witchcraft and the Grimoire Journal both came out this year. These books are written for witches of all skill levels to help you begin a relationship with the planet or deepen that relationship. If you'd like to make a donation one time, you can go to my website and click buy me a coffee. 
or you can join my private monthly membership group through Patreon at patreon.com slash thefatfeministwitch. If you have a witchy product, service, or publication and you want to reach a magical audience, you can advertise here on the show. Just go to advertisecast.com slash thefatfeministwitch to find out prices and to get started. Have a wonderful weekend, witches, and welcome to the season of The Witch.